Welcome to Jack's Conversations. It's my pleasure today to have as our guest in Jack's Conversations with Professor Dame Carol Robinson of the University of Oxford. Um, Carol is highly accomplished and successful as a scientist. She holds a Dr. Lee Chair of Chemistry. She's director of the Kavli Institute for Nanoscience, has nine honorary doctorates and four honorary titles. Uh, among the many other accolades that she's received, she's a foreign associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and is past president of the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry. Welcome, Carol. Um, it's great to have Thank you here. You. And I should add that um, she is now an associate editor with the Journal of the American Chemical Society, where she is handling uh, chemical biology in the most general sense, but uh, specifically the more analytical side um, of chemical biology. So welcome. Um, perhaps we start off with, uh, you want to introduce yourself in case I've missed something. Uh, I don't think you did, Eric. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and I'm very happy to be an associate editor of JAX. So what I want to do is um, ask you a number of questions. Some are, are about career and your own personal experiences. Um, some are about science in general and the discipline. And then um, towards the end, I want to pick your brain and ask you questions as to what we can do better at, uh, in JAX as we um, evolve into the future, if that's okay with you. Okay. So um, let me start out with, um, what's your vision uh, for the field of chemistry? Where do you see it going in the future? Well, I guess from my own viewpoint, I would say, um, very much into biology. I'm fascinated by the intersections of the different sciences. So I think um, biology with chemistry transforms biology. I think with physics, it, it also adds to physical measurement. But actually having, I very much like applied science. And so taking chemistry into biology for me um, gives some fascination to both subjects. It's the intersections. And that's actually what I'm planning on capitalizing on in my new institute is to get those intersections up and running. Did you know you always wanted to work at, um, at interfaces of chemistry, biology, no, and physics? No, I actually, I really liked chemistry as a student. It was my favorite of the sciences. I liked the exactness of it, the fact that you could predict and interpret things. But as I've got older, I've find that chemistry has a lot to add to biology and, and vice versa. Um, and actually looking at the molecular level of biology, I think is fascinating. So if I could go back to the fact that you're director of this Kavli Institute for Nanoscience, which by, which by definition is interdisciplinary, um, what are the challenges in that, in that, in that job? How, how do you manage that, uh, getting people to talk to each other and, and, and work together? It's a great question. Um, I've only just taken on this new role, so I'm, I'm still finding <laughs> out. We have um, seven, seven different departments across two divisions, and this is the first time Oxford has ever done anything like this. So actually trying to get people to pull together to, to talk to each other in languages that we all understand. And actually chemistry is at the heart of it. So um, as the first director, I really want chemistry to have a very prominent position in this new institute. Um, yeah, we are learning lots of um, different skill sets. So we have uh, people studying the brain, bacteria, um, malaria, lots of very exciting things, which I think chemistry has a great part to play in. How do you manage keeping up with all those various uh, areas? I wouldn't say I was an expert, but I can pick up enough in a particular area to speak about it in a semi-knowledgeable way, I would suggest. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought, um, I, I agree with you, it's, it's impossible sometimes to keep up um, when one is working with collaborators at the interface. And this is where one skills, sort of analytical skills in a broad sense, uh, asking the right questions um, and, and not being too narrowly focused come, come to bear, right, for, for a successful meeting um, of that type. I'm curious, so since, since part of running such an organization involves communication among scientists, um, I think one of the difficulties we face in general is communication to the general public. Um, why do you think it's so difficult for the public to get the centrality of chemistry, the importance of chemistry? It seems like we've all sat on airplanes and um, so 
somebody asks what you do and the minute chemistry comes out, it's never good after that, right? <laughs> it has a bit of a bad <laughs> reputation and I don't really see why. Actually, I, I think the pandemic has helped it become seem to be more important. So now um, I can talk to the person on the, haven't been on a flight lately, but <laughs> um, if I were on a flight and somebody said, what do you do? I think how chemistry has actually helped in the pandemic would actually be a good starting point because you can explain about detection, you can explain about new medicines, you can explain a lot of things through chemistry that actually resonate with, with the public. I mean, if I talk to people in my home village that, and I say I'm going into work, they say, oh, do you find a drug for COVID? And say, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> That's my, you know, one of the dreams. But um, or just studying and trying to understand it, which we have, of course, done with our mass spectrometry tools. But I, I do think that it's becoming much more acceptable to be a chemist and to um, really be able to talk to the public about what we're trying to do with chemistry to cure diseases and, and and conditions. I don't know if you found it to be the case that uh, the biggest challenge initially is getting your family to know what you're doing, right? Be that uh, <laughs> parents or siblings or um, or uh, sons and daughters, right? Uh, that are not scientists. Uh, they don't well, quite understand why we do what we do <laughs> at all hours of the well, day, right? Please. I Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. So I have I had two experiences with that. So when I was a younger scientist and my son was very much into computer graphics and I got him to design a front cover for me and to do that, he had to understand what I was doing. So that was actually a really kind of special time. And then I took um, my daughter to work with me for a while and we have a mother-daughter paper which I'm exceptionally proud of. That's in Angabanti Shami, sorry. But, um, it's, um, yeah, something I'm particularly proud of. Is she a of. chemist as well? She's a mathematician. So she did some oh. mathematical modeling for my paper. So, yeah. And actually, she always puts it on her CV and she's in finance now. And people say, what is this that you did? So, um, yeah, it was about uh, modeling protein unfolding structures. That sounds kind of cool. Huh? Um, was, let me follow yeah. up with some questions. Um, what advice would you give to the next generation of academicians as they're trying to craft a career path forward um, in rather unusual times to begin with. So hopefully it'll only get easier um, for them. My sort of mantra is that you have to sort of be passionate about what you do and then everything else just falls into place. So I've never really had a, a map or a plan of what I was going to do. I just enjoyed what I did and I still enjoy what I do. So I feel I'm extremely privileged to have that. I started in mass spectrometry at the age of 16 and I'm still going. So, I mean, I, it's been fascinating for me and every morning, I'm almost every morning, I'm keen to get into the lab to see what's happening. And I still get excitement from seeing that something that's flown that's never flown before is something I enjoy to this day. How is it that you were doing mass spec at 16? <laughs> uh, well, I started as a laboratory technician at Pfizer, and um, I did all different uh, types of analytical chemistry. I did NMR, I did chromatography, I did spectroscopy, and I came to the mass spectrometry lab, and I just loved it. It was very practical, and I've always enjoyed my pitting myself against the machine as I see it. That it was a very um, temperamental thing in those days. It was always broken and <laughs> spend most of my day trying to fix it. And then at the end of the day, you get something amazing, some great spectrum. and You'd feel that your, your whole day had been validated. And it's a technology that's evolved unbelievably so in the last uh, 30 years, right? Uh, uh, I mean, I can do what I do thanks to advances in, uh, in high resolution mass spectrometry, right? Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, and you've sure, part yeah. of that. So that must be a very special feeling. It is. Um, I can't claim credit for all aspects, but being part of the, the protein structure movement has been a very exciting time. Um, I started, I was looking at very small molecules, potential drug candidates. And to me, it's sort of almost gone full circle now because I can look at the small molecules trapped within my much larger assemblies and I can fragment those now and go back to my training and, 
um, identify the small molecule that's hiding and controlling uh, the very much larger protein assembly. Since you started talking about the start of your career, I wonder if you could share with us um, what it was like uh, as a young startup uh, uh, in, in your era. Um, what do you think was critical to your success um, at the time? So I, I um, attribute things to my mentors hugely. I think when I was at Pfizer, I was a school leaver and somebody said to me, but why did you leave school? You know, why didn't you stay on and go to university? I said, well, I didn't really think about it. And he said, well, you, you know, it's not too late, go to college. You should go to college. You should go to night school. So I did all this night school. Then I went um, obviously to university eventually. Um, but if he hadn't have said that, I probably wouldn't have gone. So, you know, I am massively grateful to him. And then I, that was Trevor Kemp at Pfizer. And then I met Chris Dobson. I had a career break, but then I came back as a postdoc at Oxford. And he really encouraged me to just move forward. You know, don't wait till you've got all these things. Because I was the person who always said, oh, no, I need another paper. I need to do this. He said, no, just apply. Go for these things. And he really taught me to be more confident and more proactive and to get out there and <laughs> go for things when I felt I wasn't ready. So I, I see that as my role now to do that to the next generation, to really try to persuade them to apply for things when they think they haven't quite got all the qualifications. Actually, that's usually the sign of a great uh, scientist, right? Uh, that self-doubt. It's possible to have too much of that, right? But because it keeps yeah. you motivated to improve yourself and to learn new things and to, to move in new directions. Right? What do you consider your biggest success as a researcher, as a teacher, as a mentor, or, or all of the above? I'm proud of the people I've mentored. I would say I, I follow their careers. I look at um, their publications, sort of stalking, maybe, but it, I think it's okay. Um, yeah, so I have had many successful women go off into mass spectrometry and start their own labs. I'm very proud of all of those, but also the men um, that I've coached and encouraged to, to do these things. And I still hear from most of them. So I guess I'm most proud of that. Um, I also, you know, I'm trying to think, I think being president of the Royal Society of Chemistry was a great thing for me because um, I did the Royal Society of Chemistry degree. So, and this was the part-time degree that was available to me at that time. And I thought this is a way of paying back. Without that degree, I would not have had this career. I'm now going to do this and make sure that there are pathways for young scientists who perhaps like me did not go to university at the first uh, the first opportunity but actually realize later that this is what they wanted to do so i was very keen to look at the technicians and how we accredit them for their skill sets while i was the president is there anything specifically you would tell a young um, up and rising academic to avoid oh avoid um, uh, would I avoid? I think we can have, <laughs> well, this is uh, partly my problem. I can be on too many committees and too many meetings and never get the attention that I want to give to my science. And I think particularly I've noticed with um, some younger women, they're very keen to please and accept every appointment, every um, hiring committee, every everything going basically because there's not enough women so we tend to get to sit on all committees but sometimes i think you just have to say no and um, quite firmly that you are actually doing more than your share and it is time to focus on your research otherwise i think you get unduly disadvantaged by that so avoid too many committees i guess is my advice uh, that's, that's sound advice um uh, to follow Carol, I note that you have the title um, of Dame uh, Carol Robinson. I wonder, I'm curious, um, how is that uh, the event? How was, uh, I'm curious as to how that happens. And did you get to meet the Queen? Uh, yes. Um, so you go to Buckingham Palace, uh, been in the news lately. Um, but um, actually, interestingly, if you're knighted, you have a sword, which is dramatic and it's on your shoulders. And you don't get that for women, <laughs> it's very sexist. Um, you just get a, a small 
brooch pin. So um, <laughs> I think my uh, some of my children's friends thought, oh, it's very boring. You didn't get a sword, isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> I just got a pin. <laughs> uh, a, a sword is clearly the thing that everybody wants. But no, I didn't get a sword. <laughs> I'd like to pick your brain about Jax, since uh, you're now an associate editor and and play a key role in maintaining the the quality that it's that it's known for. Um, do you have a favorite publication of your own that that is in Jax? I do actually. In the 1990s, I was just me and one of my students, and we have a communication, and it um, is about Groel, which um, became actually quite. An important molecule for mass spectrometry. A lot of people use it to tune the instrument, and um, we just wrote it as a very short communication. And sometimes I think it's a bit naive, <laughs> um, but I'm also proud of it because nobody had really heard of me, and Jax took it. And I feel it changed my career because people started to notice it. So it's a big step. Um, if you think, you know, came back from a career break. Um, didn't have a group, didn't really know what I was doing <laughs> particularly, wrote this passionate paper about um, this protein, which got published. And then not only the editor, but other people contacted me. And I felt my career changed. I really did. I got invited to meetings to talk about this. And then I got onto that sort of circuit. And then other people invited me to other meetings. And so I often say to people, you know, one paper and you don't know which one, but it can just change your career. And so I'd like to think with Jacks that I could spot those and similarly give that person a chance. How to do that is quite difficult because um, they don't have a history necessarily. I didn't have a history. So you can't sort of think, oh, well, is this a person that I know? Is this a person that's doing really well? You have to look at the paper and see if it's transformative, even if you maybe don't quite know that person or the, the community doesn't know that person. Somehow they have to have a chance to, to shine. Well, that's great to hear that Jack's uh, made a big difference um, in your early yeah. career. Um, what do you think Jack's could do better? Or I mean, maybe I should preface that with uh, what, what has Jack's done well, although it sounds like you've answered that already, but what could it do better uh, as we chart a course ahead um, in this new century. I think uh, Jax is making good moves to get up to date on Twitter and doing all these things that I think are incredibly important for journals. Um, I think we could do some more slightly thematic things. I, I think we don't go down that route, but sometimes I think those get noticed in journals. I know we're much bigger, much more, more diverse sort of community that we're serving. But I noticed that if there's a few, um, sort of a special issue with a few papers on a particular topic, I think that could be quite nice to really highlight a field, whereas the field is kind of within the journal and you can look for it, but it's never sort of picked out, say four or five key thought leaders in that field really saying the direction and the um, excitement that there is in that field. I think that could be a nice thing to put forward. Try to give more young people a, a chance. How do we do that? I don't really know how to do that, but if you could somehow pick those papers, I think that would be a great service to the community. It's been uh, great talking to you and, um, and hearing some of your thoughts on the discipline, the journal, and your career. You have an amazing career. Um, that uh, certainly serves as a, as a role model to, to many. Um, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to share with us. Very nice to talk to you.